Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to cartoonist Chris Brown, artist and writer of the daily newspaper comic strip Hagar the Horrible. Stick around, or we'll share the luck of Lucky Eddie with you. Hey, did you know that you can listen to the latest Mr. Media on your phone with the Stitcher app? Stitcher is smart radio for your smartphone. Mr. Media is on demand and on the go with Stitcher. Download Stitcher for your phone today. Get the free download at Stitcher.com. That's S-T-I-T-C-H-E-R.com. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 700 archived celebrity interviews for your listening pleasure. The show is brought to you today by 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Planning a wedding, mitzvah, or corporate event in the New York, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania area? For any and all occasions, call 1-800-DIAL-DJs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs. That's 1-800-342-5357. And look them up online, 1-800-DIAL-DJs.com. Tell them Mr. Media sent you. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of famous Vikings, including Leif Erikson, Eric the Red, and Brett Favre, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Hagar the Horrible is finally getting his due. The adventures of one of the most unique, consistently funny comic strip characters, a dirty, drunken Viking, of all things, is finally being collected in book form with publication of Hagar the Horrible, the Epic Chronicles. The strip, created in 1973 by Dick Brown, co-creator with Mort Walker of High and Lois, holds a special place in my heart. When it debuted, I was a 13-year-old with his own subscription to the Newark Star-Ledger. My parents paid for home delivery of the New Brunswick Home News, but it was an afternoon paper with horrible comics and even worse sports coverage. So I took my own money each week, earned cutting lawns in the summer, shoveling snow in the winter, and paid for a morning Star-Ledger subscription. And I'm proud to say that because of that, I have read Hagar from the very beginning. It was a big kick then, a few years ago, when an odd business magazine assignment landed me in the Sarasota, Florida home and studio of Chris Brown, son of Dick and his successor on Hagar. Chris was a wonderful host, and I think it's safe to say we hit it off pretty famously. Friendship aside, it's taken me years to convince Chris to step up to the microphones for a Mr. Media interview. But the timing couldn't be better as we celebrate his father Dick's original work and Chris's continuing efforts on Hagar the Horrible. And with that, Chris Brown, my old friend, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Media. I love being here. It's been too long. I I see you came appropriately dressed. (laughs) Yes, I did. I have my my infamous uh, paper mache helmet. (laughs) It makes the same sound of you. <laughs> but, uh, yes, this is my, uh, I, I couldn't find uh, one of those uh, cheap plastic styrofoam helmets that fit me, so I made one. <laughs> is, that, is that true Viking blue? It's true Viking blue. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you, funny you should mention uh, uh, the Vikings because I, uh, uh, I think that the, I have blue and gold on this particular helmet because I, uh, my nephew was one of the Florida Gators. Oh, so good. I have a, I have a, at the time they were blue and gold. Actually, I think they've got, uh, some kind of orange, orange going on now. I'm not sure if orange they changed the colors. Oh, yeah. orange, and orange, blue. orange and blue. So let's get in there and fix those horns up with some orange. I know, you know, <laughs> I know. it looked like I've got a couple of, uh, you know, cassava's stuck to my head or something. So <laughs> I'll probably do that. <laughs> so, Chris, tell everybody what took you so long to get to the show, because you know we've been asking you for a while. Oh, well, you know, I had a... Uh, it's, it's true. It's true. And I would have loved to have been on the show actually every week. I would love to have been your Ed McMahon, <laughs> you know? But uh, uh, because I am a Danish ham, I must say that. Uh but uh, uh, the reason is, uh, four years ago, suddenly, we moved to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, uh, causing many of my friends on the East Coast to think that uh, I, uh, sanity had left me. Because we went from Sarasota, Florida, where everything is beautiful and there are 
waving palm trees to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where, where it is frequently 20 or 30 below zero in the winter. Viking weather. And uh, people thought, he's a crazy guy. But, you know, <laughs> I, I just, I love this town. It's a fabulous town, and uh, I'm very happy we moved here. But it, it, it did throw my schedule off a little bit. That's all right. So um, uh, one thing that happened was, was no sooner did I arrive here that, than I fell and broke my left arm. Thankfully, not my drawing arm, but uh, I broke my arm, and that took some, some uh, recovering. And, uh, and I had a couple of other health issues that I've recovered from also. And it's, uh, it, it's been a kind of a wild time. And then, of course, there's been the the uh, uh, getting the house set up and and learning the learning the town and all and it's been a it's been a big a big hairy move <laughs> to to move everything in your life across country to the center of the country it's been uh, it was pretty spectacular but here I well, am and, and we're delighted to have you here and we'll expect you now every week in the future uh, okay as, very good as, that's now uh, everything's settled <laughs> as our Ed McHorrible how about that. Ed McHorrible, ooh, that, can be you. that, that has a that has a ring to it, but then so does the bathtub. Ooh, <laughs> too much information, too much information. Uh, so let's get back to the topic at hand. I, I'm I'm guessing that this is a, a pretty exciting time for you and, and your brother Chance as well as the publication yes. of this new book. Uh, do you want to? Do you have the book there? Hey, yes, the Horrible, uh, the Epic Chronicles. Actually, this is the the second book in the series. Oh, and uh, have you seen this yet? Uh, no, actually, I haven't. Well, here I'm going to uh, I'm going to send this to you through my little uh, Brundle uh, Brundlefly device okay. here. Okay. Let me see. Let me let me let me just put it down into the computer transport slot okay. here. Okay, I've got it. I, I see it coming up. It should be arriving there any yep. second. There so. it is. Oh, that's great. That is it right? That is, that's it. And now, and now check, make sure that it didn't come out with the, sometimes all the printing is reverse. Oh. And occasionally if you send a baboon, it turns them inside out. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I think I got it right here. Thank you. Oh, that's thank great. Thank you very much. I, I love modern technology. I look forward to reading that. Now, I do have the, uh, the first version, uh, the first uh, year's worth right here. And we'll, uh, I, we'll yeah. put that up. But uh, I'm not giving you that back. So, uh <laughs> Sorry. Okay. You know, uh, I love that first edition because my brother and I wrote the introduction to it, and it was it was really good. Actually, we wrote one introduction, and then uh, the forward to the book was uh, written by Brian Walker, mm-hmm. who who might as well be a virtual brother in the Brown Clan because he's uh, he's. Uh, Mort's son, and uh, Mort is our virtual uncle. Mort Walker, I should say, the, the creator of Beetle Bailey and High and Lois, who my dad worked with for 45 years. So, uh, And now my brother uh, draws High and Lois, and uh, Brian and Greg Walker uh, write it. And, um, and then Chance works with me on Hager as well. So. I'll have to get uh, Chance and Brian and Greg on the show sometime. I've had Mort's actually been on twice, oh, I uh, so I think we need to you know close the circle and have the rest of the guys on. Oh, that's great! That's great. They would love it. They would just love now, it. Now we're going to have to break uh, already for for commercial in just a second. But um, you know, I'm thinking there has been this uh, the last couple of years has been this real uh, growth in uh, collected dailies. Uh, I think it started. It really drew attention and was done well with uh, Calvin and Hobbes and then uh, yes. uh, Farside. They, uh, there were some beautiful editions of those. But then uh, uh, Charles Schultz's Peanuts is uh, getting that kind of attention. And uh, now to you know see Hagar, to me personally, I just think it's wonderful. It is. It is. It's, it's, well, you know, and also they did a lovely, lovely job on this. Well, I'll tell you about that after the break, but they, they really they did it upright. All so. Right. I'm very happy with uh, what Titan Books has done with this series. All right. so. Well, let's do that. Let's take a quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media Radio interview with Hagar the Horrible. No, not Hagar himself, despite the, uh, the horns. <laughs> this is cartoonist Chris Brown, who draws and writes Hagar. There you go. And we'll be right back. How can we help our kids prepare for the future? 
This is Stevie Van Zandt. I don't have to tell you that children face pretty tough challenges these days. It can be pretty hard to keep them involved in their schoolwork. We adults need to make sure our kids find something in school that really sparks their interest. And nothing does that like music. Not only is music in school fun, but studies show that kids who learn music find science and math concepts easier to grasp, and that they show significant increases in self-esteem and thinking skills. Music and creativity go together. Your school music teacher can tell you all about it. So help prepare your children for the future. Art is not a luxury. It is an essential component of the quality of life. Encourage them to learn to love music. A PSA brought to you by MENC, the National Association for Music Education. Music, part of a sound education. Well, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media Radio interview with Hagar the Horror Book cartoonist Chris Brown. Uh, Chris, how, how old were you when Hagar debuted? Oh, gosh. Oh, many, many years ago in a galaxy far, far <laughs> away. Uh, you know, uh, Hager started in 1973, I think, right? 1973. We started working on it in 1972. So when we started working on it, I was exactly 20. Oh, okay. But I've been working with my dad around the studio uh, really since I was about 15. So, Yeah, so now you said we. That's what I was kind of getting at. You were involved in the strip from the beginning. Yes, from the very beginning. In fact, I, I think that my, the thing I am the most proud of from that first month is that I saved Lucky Eddie, who is Hager's sidekick, mm -hmm. from the wastebasket. My father was going to use Lucky Eddie in one gag, and then that was it. Oh. You would never see Lucky Eddie again. And I, I literally took it out of the wastebasket and uncrinkled it and held it up in front of him, and I said, this is a keeper. This is the Robin to your Batman, you know, <laughs> so the, the, the Sancho Panza to your Don Quixote. So uh, uh, I'm very pleased with that, and uh, I'm pleased with that on a number of levels. But... Um, uh, all the characters in the strip are based on members of, of our family. And Lucky Eddie is very special to me because he is based on uh, Edmund Brown, who was uh, my, my father's brother. Oh. And who passed away several years ago. But uh, he lived long enough to see himself semi-immortalized in, uh, in, uh, in comic strips as Lucky Eddie. So. And, and what about uh, Hager's wife? Hager's wife, Helga, was based on my wonderful mother, uh, Joan Brown. Oh, Rose. Yes, and, uh, uh, you know, like my father, Joan was uh, uh, Irish-American on both sides of the family, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, her ancestors came from County Clare, and my father's ancestors came from County Cork in Ireland, both desperately poor uh, places, and uh, they met in uh, in New York mm -hmm. and fell in love. Uh, she worked in the in the uh, subscription uh, the circulation department at Newsday, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, my father uh, started dating her. And as he liked to say, he took her out of circulation. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Uh, I, only my father could pull off that joke. Sorry, that's all right. Well, you know, it's funny for me is that uh, you know, having read this strip from the very beginning, uh, <clears throat> my mother-in-law's name, Helga. Really? True. True story. Oh my gosh! You know, my wife, I've her mother. I've met a couple of Helgas in in my life, and uh, and uh, they're rare, yeah. but they're good. <laughs> and, and, and what's what's odd is, and I mean no disrespect to my my late mother-in-law, but when I met her, she looked a lot like Helga in Hagar. All right, she, woman of substance. Yes, exactly. And she changed <laughs> quite a bit over the over the time. I like to think that I tamed her or something, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it always struck me as funny to read the strip yeah. and go, "Oh, right, that's the other Helga in my life." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, well, well. My my mother was the inspiration on many levels for Helga, 
And that started my dad creatively down the path to to basing all the characters in the strip, including the dog. The dog is based on on Snurt, a real dog that my father had. <laughs> and uh, and Hamlet, the thin little wisp of a boy, was based on me when I was much thinner and wispier. <laughs> and uh, Honey was based on my sister Sally. And uh, Loot, the wandering minstrel, was based on my brother Chance, mm-hmm. who now does... High and Lois with uh, uh, Greg and Brian Walker. Uh, and the reason that my brother was a wandering minstrel in the strip is that he was in a uh, rock and blues band in 1972 and 73. So. Well, so let's, let's advance the story a little further. Uh, tell us a little about when the time came that you actually stepped into your father's uh, rather large footsteps uh, to take over Hagar. Well, in, uh, let's see, my my mother passed away in 1985, and in 1988, my dad started to get sick, and uh, at first we thought that his diabetes was getting worse, but it turned out that he had um, uh, cancer. He had a very... Uh, rare and inoperable uh, uh, cancer in his esophagus. And uh, they couldn't quite treat it with... uh, uh, They ordinarily would have treated this kind of cancer with radiation, and they couldn't because it was too close to his heart. And that that seemed to set him up for... uh, 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 As soon as the doctor saw where it was and what it was, he knew that my dad only had a a few months left, mm-hmm. and uh, it was a very sad time, very, very stressful time, and uh, my my brother and my fiancé and myself spent many, many days on end in my father's hospital room there in Sarasota, and um, uh, it, was, uh, it was a long, uh, long, sad period. And then uh, at the end of that period, uh, uh, when my dad did pass away, uh, Joe D'Angelo, my father's boss at King Features, uh, the then president of King Features, came down to Florida uh, for my father's funeral and stayed for a few days and was very gracious. And uh, he uh, took my brother and I out to breakfast one morning and asked us formally if we would be interested in continuing drawing the strips, drawing Hager and High and Lois. And we said, uh, yes, please. <laughs> Don't make us go get real jobs. <laughs> please let us continue cartooning. And uh, we, were, we were very grateful to him. I, you know, the, the syndicate, uh, syndicates are sort of your, your partner when you're doing a, a comic strip, and there are good syndicates and not so good syndicates, and uh, we've been very blessed. Uh, King Features has been obviously great to us. They have a great sales team and all like that. But uh, also, Joe D'Angelo was was and is. Uh, he's no longer the president there, but what a class yeah. guy! What a great guy! And uh, uh, really changed my life, you know, uh, and my brother's life really um, gave us uh, the ability to continue doing this. I mean, I would, I would love to continue drawing Hager regardless, but, you know, you, you have to have somebody who writes the checks who, who agrees that you should be the one to, right. to draw it, and uh, Joe D'Angelo was that guy. Yeah, and, so you, uh, took over, you took over Hager, but uh, yeah. uh, Chance didn't immediately jump in on High and Lois. He was still continuing as a minstrel, I guess, for a while. Well, uh, actually, uh, uh, Chance was Chance was working on High and Lois for, oh yeah, oh, for years before that. that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was in the 70s when, uh, when uh, you know, and, and Chance didn't really give up his music career. He just sort of put it on the back burner and put uh, working with with us on the comic strips on the front burner. 
And um, uh, it was really um, around, I think it was around 1980 that my brother and I and my parents all moved to uh, Sarasota, Florida. It was at least early 80s, late of us that that okay this is serious now we're going to we're going to uh we're going to be cartoonists now <laughs> and no so my brother was actually he worked for years on on high lois uh it was um uh you know when when dad actually passed away it was um there was like a little bit of okay now what do we do but uh but essentially, what we basically have done is we've continued to do what we were doing. And, uh, you know, my brother used to work uh, very closely with Dad on High and Lois, and now he was working with uh, Mort Walker and uh, Brian and Greg Walker on High and Lois. And uh, so, you know, it... it it was a strange time. It was a it was a, a strange transition. There was a period of about a year where I was writing the gags, doing the pencils, doing the inking, and doing the lettering, and uh, which which ordinarily we would be done by two or three or four different people. And uh, that year, when I was when I was doing all those jobs, it was. It was a little much, and I think that um, I think that I think the gags were still okay, but uh, the as I look back on it now, I realize that I I didn't really have my my chops as we say as an anchor, and I really needed uh, I really needed some uh, professional help, and I don't mean a psychiatrist. No, 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 no. Never suggest that. <laughs> um, so. Uh, my father had worked with uh, a, a great uh, political cartoonist and uh, famous anchor named Dick Hodgins, and uh, they had done a couple of graphic novels that appeared in Europe of Hager. And um, Dick came on board to help me with the inking, and a few years later, Bud Jones, who had done some of the gag writing, came on board in a larger way to write more of the gags, and uh, uh, my life's been better since. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm able to focus more on what I do best, which which is uh, uh, writing a few gags and uh, and doing a whole lot of drawing. And uh, I'm happier. I'm happier right. doing it that way. Well, uh, so. let's take one more quick break. Uh, this is Bob Adelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media radio interview with Hagar the Horrible cartoonist Chris Brown. And we'll be right back. This is a public disservice message from the National Lampoon Radio Hour. Don't waste your evenings doing volunteer work at your local mental hospital. Remember, even if you do, the crazy people there will probably think you didn't. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media Radio interview with Hagar the Horrible cartoonist Chris Brown, who, by the way, is also father-in-law of bizarro cartoonist Dan Perraro. Uh Chris, we were uh, on break, and you were telling me you had a great Stan Lee story to tell. Well, it, it, it's great to me. I don't know if it'll it's be great matters. to anybody else in the world, but it was great to me. You know, uh, one of the wonderful things about being a cartoonist uh, is Mike Peters, who does uh, Grimmy, uh, Mother Goose and Grimm. Mm -hmm. Mike Peters said, isn't this the greatest job in the world? You know, <laughs> because you not only get to draw for a living, which, which you know, is illegal in some parts of the world, <laughs> but also you get to hang out with some of the most interesting, creative, fun people, people that you would go to a Comic-Con to meet, and they're your buds, they're your buddies. And uh, my father had this. I didn't even realize how much my father had this, but my father hung out with Kurt Swan, who drew Superman for years and years and years mm -hmm. and he would play golf with him all the time and and all during those years i was reading all these great superman comic books and i and i yeah i had them memorized i loved them so much so such amazing work and uh 
And I didn't realize until Kurt Swan and my father were much older that this was that guy. This was the guy that was drawing Superman during during those those tender years of my <laughs> development, you know. So so um as I started to get involved in cartooning more and more, I started to come to more of the National Cartoonist Society functions. And um, one day in the 1980s, I was standing in line uh, in, the, in the, uh, uh, the queue to go into the ballroom of the then uh, Museum of Cartoon Art, Moore Walker's Museum of Cartoon Art, which is moved around the country, but at that time it was in Boca Raton, Florida. And I was standing in line, and I found myself standing in back of one of my gods, Stan Lee. Mm. And, uh, and we're standing in line, and, and we're, the line is moving forward, and at one point he turned around, and I introduced myself, and I, I you very sheepishly, I, I, I'm Dick Brown's son, and I, I, I love your work. I grew up, uh, and he said, oh, I know who you are. I love your work in Playboy. I love Cruiser. And I was like, oh. floored. I was floored. He had never heard of me outside of the context of that I was Dick's son, you know. But I'll, I'll tell you, that, that, that kept me going for years. That probably added a year to my life. <laughs> I just love that. And that, that's one of the things I love about cartooning. And, and the cartooning world overlaps with graphic novels and comic books and comic strips. It's well, since you told that story, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to tell one I, I do know, but uh, you can tell here. And that's how you met over, sort of over lunch, sandwiches, again, uh, Will Eisner. Oh well, uh, actually, it was it was Harvey Kurtzman okay. that I went. Although I I met Will Eisner, but I'll tell you okay. how I met Will Eisner. Yeah. Uh, uh, may, maybe you're thinking of that. Were you thinking of the the Harvey Kurtzman story, or the Will Eisner story? I, but, I was thinking, as I recall, didn't you meet? Um, you met Will. Uh, it was you and Cat, Cat Ironwood, and uh, it was at, at like in the in the sandwich or the break room or something at the one of the cartoon right. art museums. You're right, you're right. It was in the original Museum of Cartoon Art in, I think it was in Rybrook, New York, or near there, near Greenwich. You're right. You, 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 you know this story better than I do. But, uh, uh, yes, I, uh, my father and uh, Will Eisner were both going to talk on the same day at the Cartoon Museum in Connecticut. And it was fascinating. And I was my father's wheel man at the time because my father uh, uh, had had various eye problems, cataracts and glaucoma, and he no longer drove. So for many years, I, I drove him everywhere. Either myself or my brother drove him everywhere. So, yes, uh, uh, so Dad spoke for a while and, and Drew did a little chalk talk. And uh, Will got up and uh, talked and was fascinating. And then we all uh, uh, retired to this little sort of kitchen area in the back of the museum. And uh, they had made these great uh, French bread sandwiches. And they're the open jars of mayonnaise and, and uh, mustard and, and all these things were spread out. And we were just slapping sandwiches together. And sitting around, and I got to sort of sit at the uh, uh, you, you, at the foot of two of my heroes, my father and Will Eisner, uh, uh, the spirit. And there he was, as big as life. And uh, you know, he Will Eisner at this time, he looked kind of like uh, well, my impression of him was he reminded me of. The Kingpin, the, the <laughs> villain of Spider-Man. <laughs> he actually looked like uh, like if uh, if if the if if the Kingpin and and uh, maybe Lois Lane had had a child, uh, it would have been Will Eisner because he was he was far more svelte than uh, the Kingpin. But you know he 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 was he 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 was uh, lacking in hair. He was statuesque, 
And he would open his mouth, and these fantastic stories would come out of his mouth. It was fascinating. And, I, I, uh, again, I felt like, well, this is heaven. This is just heaven. I've been blessed by many amazing moments like that where I've been, uh, uh, I, I've actually been able to, I've been, a, I've been able to become friends with various cartoonists that I love. I've worked for, uh, uh, over the years, I've worked for some of the most amazing editors ever. I mentioned to you uh, uh, earlier that I, I had done some work with Byron Price. Uh, I also worked with Michelle Yuri at Playboy Magazine, really the greatest editor uh, I ever worked with. And um, uh, just, just fascinating people, fascinating people uh, uh, over the years. And uh, uh, I've been very blessed. And now here I am in South Dakota, a different kind of blessed. <laughs> <laughs> true, very true. Um, and let's uh, let's touch on one more thing, and then we'll take our last break. And I promise this will okay. be the last break. Um, I mentioned as we came back that you are a father-in-law of Dan Peraro, the cartoonist yes. behind Bizarro. Um, didn't plan to be the father-in-law of Dan Peraro, as I recall. It's just kind of <laughs> kind of happened. It's one of those things that happened in Vegas, but that actually people talked about after Vegas. Th that that's right. It didn't stay in yep. Vegas. What happens in Vegas sometimes follows you home like the Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> but uh, uh, actually, w the day that we met Dan, uh, we were taking a big family trip, and my daughter was uh, living at this point in New York City, and we were living in uh, Florida, and we had other relatives that were living in California, and we converged. Uh, in California, and then all drove together to Las Vegas, and uh, the 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 day that we met Dan, uh, as far as we knew, this was a, a a friend of Ashley's, probably somebody that she was dating, and that's really all we knew about him. We knew that he was a hugely talented cartoonist, and uh, she had met him at uh, one of the um, National Cartoon Society functions, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's really all we knew about him. And then in the afternoon, he said he had a surprise to, <coughs> to spring on us, and uh, would we all meet him down in the lobby? And we knew that he was friends with Penn and Teller, and we thought he's got tickets to Penn and Teller. That's the big surprise. Well, no. What he had was a ring, and he proposed on the spot to Ashley. She accepted. A limousine pulled up. We all piled into it, and we drove off to one of these little chapels where Dan and Ashley were married hours after meeting Dan <laughs> uh, by an Elvis impersonator, <laughs> just like you see in the movies. <laughs> And Elvis comes out, and he has a boombox playing the da-da-da, you know, the introductory music that you always hear for Elvis coming on stage. And here comes Elvis. He's got the white flowing cape and the Elvis, whatever you call that. And uh, he comes out with the boombox, and he says, let's hear it for the band. <laughs> and he puts the boombox down in this chapel. And uh, I, I noticed this one thing. I, I you know... I, I don't want to paint the picture of myself as being superstitious, but there were 20 people in the room with cameras, and there was also a video camera that was shooting a documentary uh, about Dan. Okay? There were a lot of cameras and a lot of different kinds of cameras. And when we went into the chapel, none of the cameras worked, <laughs> including the giant video camera that was being hoisted by, like, a professional cameraman. None of the cameras worked. None of the microphones worked. It was as if we were in, like, some sort of a Stephen King story where, you know, and I thought, this is bad. This is a bad sign. You know? I immediately wanted to check Dan's scalp for three sixes and things like that. You know? so, so, but indeed, they did get married. The marriage took. They are still married. He's turned out to be a wonderful guy. And, uh, uh, as I've mentioned to you, my my biggest qualm with Dan now is that he just draws too well. 
<laughs> he's very funny, and he's uh, he's uh, he's he's a very very talented artist and uh, multi talented. And it turns out that uh, I do love him now. <laughs> I. You know, at the time, the limo driver, I was sitting next to the limo driver. We, we just had people packed in the limo to go to the little chapel. And the limo driver could see that I wasn't taking this <laughs> news really well. I was sort of, I was sort of on, on high mm-hmm. simmer, you know. And the limo driver looked back at Dan, and he looked over at me. Now, you understand, the, the, Dan had been talking to the limo driver for over a week right. setting this up, you know. So the limo driver, I only had known Dan for about three hours. So, uh, so the limo driver looked back at Dan, and he, he looked over at me, and he said, you know, he seems like a nice guy. <laughs> and I looked back at the limo driver, and I said, well, you know him better than I do. Oh, I was very man. proud of that line. <laughs> All right. But for the passage of time, He's he's he grown on me. In fact, only on my north side, like lichen. <laughs> but <laughs> take a lichen oh, to God. a lichen. And on that, ladies and gentlemen, let's take our final break. <laughs> this is Bob Handelman, and you are listening to and no doubt watching the Mr. Media interview with Hagar the Horrible cartoonist and father-in-law of Pizarro cartoonist <laughs> Chris Brown. And we will be right back. Maybe you're getting overdue notices from creditors. Your accounts are being turned over to collection agencies. You may be worried about losing your home or your car. When you don't have enough money to cover your family's living expenses and pay all your bills, the first step is to reduce your spending wherever and however you can so you don't keep falling farther behind. For ideas on how to cut spending, visit www.toughtimes.illinois.edu. A message from University of Illinois Extension and this station. This is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to and hopefully watching the Mr. Media Radio interview with Hagar the Horrible Cartoonist, Chris Brown. And while we were away, Chris was telling me a story. Hello, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Bob. I doff my headphones to you, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, Chris was just telling me a great story about uh, how uh, after his dad died, he, he had to go to New York and meet with some King Features uh, uh, salespeople and the editors and really convince them that he could... Uh, he could do the job, and yes. um, he did that by uh, doing a drawing of uh, Hager uh, upside down, and uh, so he could prove to them that he knew the strip upside down and inside out. And uh, coincidentally, he told that story, and I happen to know that he has a little pad handy and uh, has, do. has agreed to give us a little demonstration, as awkward as it's going to be, of <laughs> how, how, how he draws uh, Hager. So, uh, Chris, if you still feel good about doing this, let's take a shot at it. Yes, I will. Let me see if I can get this positioned in such a way that you will be able to We're good. To see this All right. through the miracle of, of, of uh, Apple computers. <coughs> okay. I tell you what, let's see if I can. It's a, a little awkward, but I, I tell you, I'll give, it my, I'll give it my best shot. Okay. Let's see. The problem here is going to be when I look away from the, the screen. Okay. Can you make that out? Yep. No problem. As a matter of fact, I have my black Sharpie. Let me see if we can get it in the kit. And a, a piece of SpongeBob uh, stationery oh. upside down. So, uh, yeah, I'll be drawing here as well. Uh, it won't look anything like that, though. All right. Am I staying on screen? Yeah, okay. Good. Well, what I did was I I went into this um, office filled with the King Feature salesmen, some of the greatest salesmen in the world, and um, the vice president of King Features said, "I don't want to make you nervous, but you've got about thirty seconds to win these guys over." And so I went into the room and I drew Hager upside down like this. <laughs> right. Okay. 
I'm, I'm drawing alongside you here, and I'm telling you, it is not as easy as you make it look. <laughs> um, all right, I'll just go ahead and show folks what I've, what I've drawn while you do the real thing. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I'm just. I love that. I'm just copying very badly. Let's take her after a battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't look any better up, up, upright, folks. Oh my goodness. Okay, so now let's let's focus on the well, real so thing. Look at that. This is what I. This is what I did. I drew Hager upside down, and then I flipped it over, like that, so that they could see that I basically got it right. <laughs> And uh, but I did this real big. Okay. I did a real, real giant on a big newsprint pad, and then I turned to them and I said, "Now you can go tell the the editors that the new guy knows Hager backwards and forwards. That that you saw him draw Hager upside <laughs> down." And they applauded, and that broke the ice. And I've I've told Ashley, my daughter, over the years, Ashley, that was the cartoon that allowed you to go to college. Very good. <laughs> so. But I, I, I was mentioning to you earlier that uh, when my dad passed away, Hager was in 1,600 newspapers, about half of that inside the United States and half of that in Europe and other mm -hmm. places around the world. And that's a fabulous list, and we were very happy. But I was nervous when dad passed away that, that um, we would lose some papers because that does happen when – the originator, when the real creator of a strip passes on and it, the work passes on to somebody else's hands, very often you will you will lose uh, some papers. Well, in the three years uh, following my dad's passing, we actually picked up um, we picked up over two hundred more papers. We didn't lose papers, and. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell you very honestly that it was not because I had added some little dash of Tabasco sauce or something to my ink. It, it certainly wasn't that I was um, uh, that I was writing better or drawing better because those first couple of years were not my best work. Uh, the salesman at King Features really uh, they really came through and they got Hager into papers where it hadn't appeared previously, and they managed to convince editors to give me a shot, to uh, hang in there with me. They were great. Uh, I've worked for three syndicates. I really have nothing bad I can say about any of the syndicates I've worked for. I've worked for the three greatest syndicates uh, in the world, Universal, United Media, and King Features. You, you can't work for better people than this. Uh, but I have to say that um, King Features is very special. Uh, I, I think that uh, should I ever do another comic strip, it'll, I'll probably offer it to King Features first because they have some of the best. Uh, they have some of the best people behind the scenes, including the salespeople and uh, um, and the executives. They have some amazing people, people that really care about the comics, and, uh, well, that's it. I'm going to get sloppy. <laughs> Let's not have that happen. <laughs> it's a great syndicate. It's a great syndicate. I've, I've been very lucky. I've worked for some great magazines and some great, uh, some great people over the years, and I've been blessed. Well, now, you, you mentioned, and, and before we wrap it up, you did mention uh, doing a second strip. Uh, when we met, you were doing uh, Raising Duncan about uh, yes. uh, your pup. And uh, I wondered, you being a, a cartoonist and being a Brown, I imagine that doing something on the side is never too far from uh, uh, your focus. Uh, obviously, you're doing, you've been doing Hagar full-time for many years, and you, yes. you, you have done other things. You did Cruiser, you did Raising Duncan, yep. a Cruiser for Playboy. Um, what's in your mind now? Is it, is it books? Is it, you know, what kind of things do you want to be doing in addition? It is books. Amazing that I knew that, <laughs> folks. Yeah, see, you did that very well. This, this, is, this is not my book, okay. <laughs> but it is a book, as you can see with the title. This is a wonderful, wonderful children's book by Lane Smith, who did The Stinky Cheese Man and many other things. And uh, 
I just um, I just love children's books. I love comic strips. I'm going to keep drawing comic strips until they take my pencil away. But uh, I do want to do children's books on the side. I, I Over the last couple of years since I've moved here, I've formed uh, a couple of really nice relationships with a few editors in New York City, uh, including uh, uh, there's one editor at one of the major book publishers in uh, New York who seems to like my work. I've never met her in person. I've only corresponded with her through the mail. But she has um, assured me that if I keep sending her books, she is going to find the book of mine that she will be able to publish. And uh, she has given me sage advice over the last couple of years, including not so many dinosaurs. There are a lot of dinosaur <laughs> books out there. So... Uh, uh, I'm hoping that uh, in the very near future I will be able to, I will be able to ring you up over this magical device, this crystal ball that you have, Mr. Media, and that I will be able to announce to you that I have finally got a children's book that I can show. I do have, I have a sketch of two characters okay. here. This is on like a little, a little odd piece of paper. This shows you how, what, a, what a class <laughs> operation I have. have like, like, spare I have no like, expense. Like, laundry lists and things that I, I draw on. Well, these are two characters, and uh, you know what? I, I can't even tell you the names of these characters because the names of these characters is a secret. Ah. And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why it's a secret. These characters are based on two real children that I met here in Sioux Falls, and... Uh, I don't want those kids to know that these characters are named <laughs> after them until I have a book that I can place in their hands because their names are part of the title. You're not keeping these kids in the basement right now, are you, Chris? <laughs> no, 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 no. No, no. They are, uh, they are actually the first two children that I met. Uh, they're a brother and a sister, and they are a brother and a sister in the book. And... Um, this is actually a book that is that is sitting on the desk of my hopefully my editor in New York City right now, and uh, I I already got a note back from the editor saying I've got your package and I can't wait to read it, and I had drawn this big elaborate cartoon on the envelope, and she said Oh by the way I am framing your envelope, <laughs> so that Very that was nice. lovely that was lovely to hear nice. so. So hopefully that will be my other hat will be that of a children's book author well, that would artist. Be great. That would be just great. Would well, be listen, great. folks, we spent a good long time with Chris Brown. He's a wonderful guy. Uh, I want to encourage you. Yes, check I out Check out his work every <laughs> single day in your local newspaper. He's the cartoonist on Hager the Horrible. And you can order the first books in the series – Hagar the Horrible, the Epic Chronicles. I'll hold one up here, but we'll be, you'll be Thanks. seeing it throughout the interview. It's Hagar the Horrible, the Epic Chronicles. The first two books are out. The third book is on its way. These are from Titan Books. You can see it at, you can, uh, see it at titanbooks.com, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. Uh, Chris, uh, always a pleasure to talk. So glad we finally got you to do the show, and uh, I hope you'll come back uh, soon. I absolutely will. Mr. Media has a special place in my enlarged Viking heart. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, Chris Brown, thanks so much for being on Mr. Media, and good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Great to see you. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. For more original interviews with your favorite daily cartoonists, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Subscribe to Mr. Media on iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Just search Mr. Media Interviews from within iTunes and subscribe for free. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many locations. If you've got an idea for a guest to comment on today's show or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Thanks so much for joining us today. I really appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening.
Hey everybody, this is Kevin.com Brown from the Emmy Award winning 30 Rock, and you know what? I wish I had 30 Rocks to throw at Mr. Media's ass. Yeah! <laughs>